looking in the book of Joshua from the Old Testament about God's road to success. And last week we said it can be a little bizarre. Remember that? He told them to march around the city for seven days, or actually six days in a row, and don't say a word, just have a big band parade, blow your trumpets, and you know, they, they went around the city the sixth day. On the seventh day, they do the same thing only seven times around, and then um, on the seventh time, everybody is supposed to yell and scream and shout, and the walls would come just crashing down, and they go straight way in. We built that whole thing all off of that one little proverb that says, you know, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And so a victory came, great victory. Uh, they were told in that passage that they were to devote everything to the Lord. Everything. They weren't to take a single thing. They were to kill everything that was alive in it, because it was devoted unto the Lord as a sacrifice. And they were not to take any of the silver or gold, but they would have actually put that in the Lord's treasury. But everything else was to be destroyed, and then they were to burn it. It was almost like a burnt offering unto the Lord. Okay, they were to totally devote everything, totally, 100% to God. Well, sometimes we have setbacks in our lives. They had a setback. Because in the chapter that follows uh, that great success, we, we notice that there's a setback. Now, the source of the setback is, but the Israelites acted unfaithfully. Okay. <coughs> now, for my image of unfaithfulness here, I'm uh, playing on a marriage. You know, when you get married, you make a promise to that other person that you will be faithful for your whole life. Just them, no one else. That's it. So, any breach of that is called unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in, in regard to the devoted things. The devoted things are the holy things. That those devoted things that were holy set apart unto the Lord. And it goes on and says, Achan the son of Carmi. He took some of those devoted things. And the thing that I noticed in this passage is very interesting. All the Israelites are going to suffer because of the one man's sin. Isn't that interesting? It's a biblical principle. You never just sin to yourself. Sin always carries consequences, and lots of them. Consequences for Achan, as we'll see in the story. Consequences for the Israelites, as we'll see in the story. But sin is primarily, it, it has consequences in your relationship to God. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things, the things that were supposed to be set apart to the Lord. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, he took some of them. Remember last week we read that passage in the book of Malachi? Will a man rob God? That's exactly what he did in this passage. He was robbing God. You, you, you know, he was stealing something that didn't belong to him. All unfaithfulness, to a certain degree, has that. Like an unfaithful husband or an unfaithful wife, when she is unfaithful, she is taking away from someone else what is theirs. If somebody commits adultery, they have taken from someone else a relationship that does not belong to them. They have stolen that. They were unfaithful. It's robbing. It's robbing. He took some of them. So Achan takes uh, some of these things, and, and it says, And the Lord's anger burned against Israel. You see, God is a holy God. I know in our culture today, the emphasis is totally upon the love of God. God, God is love, and He is love. But if you were to read historic Christian theologians, they would say the supreme attribute of God is not His love, but His supreme attributes above all is His holiness. God is a holy God. And holiness at the very part of the definition means to separate from something. You separate the special from the common. I often say, you know, in most homes they have holy dishes. You say, what? I don't think I got holy dishes at my house. In most houses have them. 
You just call them fine china. You see, you set apart your fine china from all the rest of the common, ordinary, everyday dishes. In fact, uh, you even have some that they're so ordinary and, and so mundane, you throw them away. They're throwaway, if you call them paper plates. Right? I mean, that is the glow of common you can get. Then you have to them every day, and then you have those holy dishes, fine china. That you only use on special occasions, get the word special. You only use them on special occasions for special people. And you, you handle them very carefully, very special way. If they got like silver on them, you don't want to put them in the dishwasher because that might tarnish the silver edges on them. And you, you're very careful because they're devoted to specialness. They're very special. God is a holy God. And he separated us as a holy people to be special and not like all the rest of the paper plates and common ordinary dishes. We're a special dish to God. And Israel was a special nation to God. And so when this happened, they treated the fine china like a paper, <coughs> did, a paper plate, and they trampled and threw it on the ground. The Lord was angry. Well, if I came to your house and started getting all, all of, hold of all of your fine china, start breaking it, breaking it, you'd say, whoa, hold on here, everything. You might even get upset and angry with me. At least you think the preacher's lost his mind. <laughs> the sorcerers, they were unfaithful, and because of that, the Lord was very angry. Now, there's a surprise in all of this setback that's going on. I mean, they just had a wonderful, great victory at uh, Jericho, and uh, here's the surprise. Okay, we'll, we'll get there in a second. Now, Joshua sent men from Jericho, because they just conquered it, that's where they're at, to Ai. Now, it's just a little small place. It's only about eight acres large. Uh, the size is much smaller than Jericho. And, and he sent them to spy it out. Isn't that what he just did to Jericho? He sent two spies. I was sending two spies to Ai. They wouldn't do what we did before, seeing the work. So he sent two, and, and the spies came back with this report. They just sent two or 3,000 men to take it, for there's only a few men there. Later in the Bible, it's going to tell us there are 12,000 people in that city. If you take half of that, 6,000 would be men. And you take half of that then to be, you know, fighting warriors about 3,000. He said, all you need to do is send them, uh, you know, two or 3,000. Send, send 3,000 men to take mine. Yeah, we don't have to send the whole army of Israel. For only a few men are there. So about 3,000 men went up. But they were routed. <laughs> Leave that on your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him. Something happened here. And we only need 3,000 guys. Uh, there's no consultation of the way. This all just 3,000. We'll just go do this. And they were routed by the men of Ai. And as a result, there were 36 men who died. There are always some consequences <coughs> to our sinful behaviors. And though it was the, the one sin of one man, the whole nation was suffering. Now, the impact of the setback is huge, especially for Joshua. There is emotional anguish when you have a setback. I think that you have a setback the same way. If you're working on a project at work and uh, everything's going fine, and then all of a sudden your boss comes in and says, hey, everything you've done it is totally, terribly wrong. We've got to fix it. All of a sudden you get this terrible feeling deep down in your gut like, I blew it, I messed up. Joshua tore his clothes. He fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord. Joshua was really, really disturbed. A guy knocks on the door one day in the previous church and answered the door. He said, man, i got to go to your sanctuary and pray. He comes running in. I don't know who this guy is. He's never been there before. He comes into the sanctuary, gets on his knees, man, he starts pouring his heart out to God. He was in big trouble. Big trouble. He was a, a driver by the living trade, and he just got a DUI. He knew he was going to lose his job. He was in deep turmoil. He fell, and he's praying. He wants us to pray to God, help him, and all that. Okay? Great emotional anguish. Why? Because he blooped. Joshua's got this great emotional anguish. And he said he remained there till evening, and then the elders of Israel did the same thing, and they sprinkled dust under him. Now, that was a custom when you were mourning, you would take throw dust up on your head. Now, 
you made yourself in dirt, okay? I mean, it's kind of like just showing how, how broken-hearted you are. Sometimes we need to go into the presence of God broken-hearted over what we've done, what's happened. Pour out our heart to the Lord. Not only did it have an emotional impact like that, but it had emotional blame shifting going with it. And Joshua said, look at this. I mean, he just laid it out there, man. He just, he is as real and transparent as can be. Here's what he says. Ah, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of our enemies? He's blaming it all like God. God, if you just would have kept us on the other side of the Jordan River, I wouldn't have gotten into this mess. Lord, if you just hadn't given me this job, I wouldn't have had this temptation. Lord, Lord, if you didn't let me buy this house, I wouldn't have met this person. Lord, it's all your fault, Lord. We've got to be careful. He's not taking full blame here, but he's throwing it back on the Lord from the emotional blame shifting. You're going to see emotional second guessing. If only, I think if only does more to discourage God's people than anything else. If, what if, if this, this, this would have happened. If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. But God told you to go across the Jordan. If I'd only been content to stay on the other side of the desert. When they left Egypt, they, they got into the, the desert there and, and they ran out of food. They said, oh, we could only go back to the leeks of the Indians and all the food of the Egyptians. And God sent a man instead. Here he's given them all of the, this prosperous land that flows with milk and honey. And if we'd only been content to stay back. When there's a failure, we tend to go on this path. You see the path that's going on here? We start complaining, we whine, and that's what he's doing. Second guessing what it could have been. And then finally he acknowledges the emotional failure. Oh Lord, what can I say now? Israel has been routed. Finally he comes to the fact that this is what's happened by our enemies. That leads to his emotional doom. I mean, he's like Eeyore. Okay? Oh, poor me, I got this cloud over me. I'll never get out from underneath it. The Canaanites and the other people in the country will hear about this and they will sur surround us and wipe out our, our name from the face of the earth. What then will, will you do for your own great name? Oh, we're in big trouble. It's just going to get worse. It's all downhill from here. Have you ever blown it and then said, oh, but Steve, you might as well do it all? How many have been on a diet and been down that road? <laughs> You blew your diet and said, oh, well, since I've blown it, my mind will just pick out. I mean, I'm on it. And then later when I get your sick as can be, because you know, you could have just stopped it right then. But there's that, oh, I'm doomed. He's got this emotional, because we're doomed. That's all. It's done. Now he's going to turn from, uh, from listing all that problem that he's got there, that emotional response to logic. The reasons for the setback. And here's the reasons, okay? The, the reason, number one, he says here, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. You're laying there, you've been on your face all day, so stand up. Israel has sinned, called them for what it is. In the New Testament, sin is defined in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned, and here's the definition, and fallen short of the glory of God. It's the fall short. If you take a, uh, an archer, for example, he's got a target, he's got a bullseye. If the arrow falls short, that's called sin. It fell short of the target. Today we call it failure. It failed to hit the target. Sin at its very heart is a failure to be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. And that's what Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. Be holy as God is holy. Israel sinned. The second thing I notice what it says here is they had violated my covenant. He agreed with them that he would give them Jericho, but the agreement was you will not touch anything in it. You'll totally destroy it. Everything belongs to me. The silver and gold you put in the treasury of, of, the, of God. But you take nothing. You get no spoils of war. None. They violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. And they have taken some of the devoted things, and they have stolen to try to rob God. He goes on, he says, 
says that they lied. He says they lied. It was deception on their part. They didn't say anything about what they took. They actually wouldn't hit it. They're, they're lying. And he says, and they have put them with their own possessions. I was just like seven or eight years old. I was just a Canadian little younger. And it was a communion Sunday. My parents would allow me to take because I hadn't yet accepted Christ as my Savior. And I hadn't been baptized and gone through the process of the church taking communion. And uh, I saw those little glass. Remember the days when they were real glass and not the plastic throwaways? I saw that little glass communion cup. Man, I really wanted it. It was empty. I don't know. Somehow it wound up in my pocket. So then I go home. All of a sudden, now what am I going to do with this? I mean, I wanted it. Now I got it. What am I going to do with this? Well, we had a junk floor in the kitchen. And I thought, well, I'll just throw it in there and get lost in all the junk. So I threw it in there, got lost with all the junk. So after lunch, you know, after Sunday afternoon dinner, well, they're all cleaning up. My mom needed something out of that junk drawer. She pulled that out. She saw a communion cup. Oh, boy. <coughs> what is this doing here? Well, nobody was fessing up. You know that dirty, that guilty, dirty feeling you have inside when you know you've done something wrong and you're caught? I fessed up. I fessed up. I had taken something that was devoted to the Lord's service. Communion cup, a little bit. I had stolen it and I put it with our house possessions. Isn't that amazing? I don't know what you're taking and you're hiding and you're putting with your stuff. It could be something so small as that, but I was going through all the emotional turmoil that Joshua was because I took And I was just a little boy. I was just a little boy. He goes on, he says, now you, you put it with your own possessions, but he also says, that is why. Here, here's the reason. Why is this happening? This is why the Israelites cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs and run. This is why I'm not telling them. He said, because they have made and they've been made liable to destruction. In the previous chapter, chapter 6, verse 16, it said you are to destroy everything because if you take anything, you make yourself liable for destruction. You bring it upon yourself. Kind of like Adam in the Garden of Eden. The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. There is a consequence for your disobedience. There's always consequences for our disobedience. Either to us or in our relationship with God, to others, anytime we're disobedient. If I'm even just disobedient to the law of gravity, and I accidentally take an A on the refrigerator, I drop it. There is a consequence. It's totally splattered and smashed. There's always a consequence. And that's what he's saying. You've been made liable for destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. So he says, go consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourself. That means be holy. Consecrate means to be holy. That, that means actually taking and separating your... You're buying China from all the rest of the dishes. Is saying, go and separate and dedicate a fresh lesson. Consecrate yourself in the preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. That which is devoted is among you, O Israel. And you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. <coughs> Sometimes we have something in our lives that hinders us from making any spiritual progress, and we're hiding it. We're hiding it. We're hiding it. <coughs> Tucked away in the book of uh, First Peter is a passage that talks about husbands and wives, and it says the husbands are to dwell with their wives in an understanding way. I find this really fascinating. It doesn't require a wife to understand her husband. She already does. <laughs> It requires a husband to understand his wife. And the verse that follows that says, you do this, you try to live in an understanding way, um, because if you don't, your prayers will be 
tendered. Oh. You mean, when I got something between my wife and I, and I pray that it's like there's a blockade put in place that I'm not, I'm not getting through? Yeah, that's what it's saying. Okay? You cannot stand when you're in disobedience. You just can't. And you're wondering why I'm spinning my wheels, I'm spinning my wheels, what's going on here? But you know all along that there's something you're hiding. It's not like he didn't know this, he knew it. He was hiding. He couldn't stand. He who is caught with the devoted thing has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing. I've just given you eight reasons from the Bible why they had their setback. And it goes all the way back to the very first one. Israel acted unfaithful and recognized. When they entered in a covenant relationship with God, it was like when I, as an eight-year-old boy, accepted Jesus as my Savior, I entered into a covenant that Jesus' blood washed away my sin. They had entered into a covenant with God that God was now their God. They were going to follow Him. And, and we're both following and trying to be obedient to the Lord. But they acted unfaithfully. God wants faithfulness. He wants us to be faithful. Now, the next part of this is about the exposure of the setback. And, and there are several verses on this, but the way it works is early the next morning, Joshua had the Israelites come forward by tribe. He brings all the tribes, there's 12 tribes, so I'm not sure if he brought every single person in the tribe, or he brought the head of the tribe and went before him. After the head of the tribe, went, Judah was taken. And after Judah was taken, it says, um, there are too many of these. The tribes were taken, then the clan was taken, and then it says the family was taken. And finally he goes on and he says that he brought them by man by man. So he's processing, whittling it down. He's, finally it's coming down to just man by man. And then finally it says, Achim, the son of Carmi, the son of Zemri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. There's an exposure. It's always exposed. Sooner or later there's an exposure. If you've been paying attention to the news this last week, you really realize it took a long time. But this guy by the name of Weinstein, he finally got exposed. Right? It may take a while, but ultimately, it says, and you may be sure your sin will find you out. Sooner or later. In another place, it says this, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. I didn't put this verse up there, but it also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things that we have done in our bodies, whether good or bad. Even if you hide it really well through this whole life, then you die and say, look at there, man, I made it. Nobody found out. The next thing is you stand before God. And your life is just laid wide open and bare. It's bare. It's bare. You really can't hide from God. I can't hide from God. We try. We try. You see, there's a slippery slope here that, that catches pretty near all of us. Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to God and the God of Israel and give, give him praise. Tell me, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. Well, he's been hiding, that's for sure. And they can reply, it's true, I have sinned. That's his confession against the Lord, the God of Israel. And this is what I have done. He's now about to tell us the slippery slope he's been on. And as he goes down through the slippery slope, he says, number one, when I saw the plunder, the beautiful robe from Babylon, I saw it, oh man. I think most of us get in trouble because our eyes are focused in the wrong area. It's a starting point. I see a new car, I gotta have a new car. I see a new dress, I gotta have a new dress. You know, I, I see, I gotta have. I see, I see, I see. So uh, it starts, I see something. And he said, I saw this beautiful uh, Babylonian, and also 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold, uh, weighing 50 shekels. That's a lot of money, man. He was gonna be set for life. He says, Then I saw what I saw and I coveted it. It's just like Eve in the garden, when she saw the forbidden fruit, and it was good for all these purposes. She coveted She wanted it. She wanted it. 
She said, I counted them and then I took them. She took the fruit, she ate the fruit, he took the garments. And then, in, in, in the book of Genesis with Eve, when she partook of the, the forbidden fruit, she gave to her husband, he also ate. And then the guys are naked, and what do they do? They try to cover it all up and hide. That's exactly what Achan said. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath it. It's a, it's a slippery slope. I see something, I want it. I take it. I hide it. And that's what I did when I was just a child. I saw the cup. I wanted the cup. I took the cup. Didn't know what to do with it. I hid the cup. You see what's going on? It's the same slippery slope. We, we all go down through this thing. There are consequences. If there's anything about this whole message is there is a consequence. Listen, in the New Testament puts it this way, Galatians. Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. There's consequences. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. That's where it starts. That was in verse 4. Verse 4, it says, they were routed in an end. Killed, there was killed about 36 men because of that. There's consequences. God's angry. Other people are suffering because of me. I will not be with you anymore. God is abandoning them. Oh my goodness. And then he said, you cannot stand against your enemy until you remove that thing. This is all failure, 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 failure. Now it's still not the only reason why, why we have, have setbacks. And just because something bad is going on in my life doesn't mean that, hey, if I look at somebody's life, something going bad, oh, they must have sin in their life. Remember, last time we saw the man that was born blind, they said, who sinned, this man or his, or his parents? He said, neither one. Neither one has sinned. It was to show the work of God. God set it up that way so I can't, every time somebody's got a problem, go on a witch hunt and find out what's wrong in their life. Okay? You can't. But I know, nobody else knows what's in my heart. I know what I'm hiding. Nobody else knows what's in my heart. You know what you're hiding from God and everyone else, no one else knows. There's consequences. All Israel took Agin, the silver, and the robe, the gold, the budgets of his son and his daughters, his cow, his donkey, his sheep, his tent, all that he had. They took the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today, just as he had said. There is consequences for taking that which belonged to the Lord. And all Israel stoned him. The curse did come upon him. Just like it did Adam, the day Adam sinned, what would human grace was punched into sin? The day you sinned, you shall surely die. He died spiritually. 930 years later, he died physically. And over that, over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remain to this day. And then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, the place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. Now, this story is not that unusual. In fact, earlier there was two sons of. Uh, Aaron, the high priest, named Nadab in the Bible, they were told to take a fire uh, from the altar, I believe it was the brazen altar, and take it in, and uh, they were to ignite the fire for the altar of incense. But Aaron's son, Nadab in the Bible, offered unauthorized fire, unholy, profane fire. They took it from somewhere other than they were prescribed, and they took it before the Lord, and it was contrary to what the Lord had commanded them. And so the text says, Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. God intruded in that moment with just judgment. Crash right into history in time. He didn't wait till the end. He did it right then. Boom. He hit them. Some of you know the story of Jonah. Jonah was told to go preach against the city of Nineveh. Go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because your wickedness has come up before. I want you to go and tell them they're wicked and I need to repent. But Nineveh was his enemy. And so Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed in the opposite direction to Tarsus. He caught a, a ship going to Tarsus, which would be towards Spain. He's going the opposite direction. He's running from the Lord. You know, he knew he was running from the Lord. Nobody had to point it out. He knew it. And so while he was on the ship, it says they, they wanted to know a storm arose at sea. They un unloaded all the wares on it. And then they said, we got to cast lots. This is somebody's fault. A lot fell. I don't know if they used dice or straws or what they used. But it would found out it was exposed to Jonah. So what have you done? He says, I'm a Hebrew prophet. I'm running from the Lord. This is what you have to do. You've got to throw me overboard if you want the ship to, to make it. Make a long story short. They took Jonah and threw him overboard. 
God intruded in space and time to expose him. And then the text says that uh, while he was being overthrown, it says, but the, the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. You know the story. Swallow Jonah. God spoke to the fish. It's interesting that while he's in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the belly of the great fish, he calls it, he's made his grave. He, he's made his grave. He's the dead. He's dead. But God spoke to the fish. The fish spits him out and he goes into these attacks. It's not that unusual. There's a New Testament account where a guy by the name of Ananias conspired with his wife the fire that they're going to sell their property and they're going to give the proceeds to the church. Only they kept back some of the money. They wanted to be recognized of giving this great contribution. But So then Peter said to Ananias, and when he came into his presence, how has Satan filled your heart so that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Who? And you've kept yourself from some... Uh, kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land. Have you? You've not lied to man, but you've lied to God. And then it says in Ananias, it says, when he heard this, he fell down dead. He fell down dead. It says in the, in the text that about three hours later, his wife comes in, not knowing what's happened to her husband. And tells the same, oh yeah, Peter says, hey, did you give everything to the Lord? And Peter says, how could you have agreed to testify to the Spirit of the Lord? And at that moment, while he's accusing her of doing the same thing her husband has done, she fell dead. She fell dead. You see, from time to time, God intrudes in space and time with judgment. And other times, he's just very forbearing. And waits till the day we all give an account. There's a warning, you know, two weeks we have the Lord's Supper here. And we take the Lord's Supper, you know, the bread represents his body which was broken for us, and the cup represents the forgiveness of sin in his blood. Apparently in the time of the first Corinthians, they were abusing the Lord's Supper. And he gives this warning right after giving instruction about the Lord's Supper. So this is very pertinent to us. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Whoa. Now he says an unworthy man. None of us are really worthy of the Lord's Supper. But he's not talking about our worth. He's talking about the manner in which we take the Lord's Supper. So what is a good way to take it? Well, he goes on to say, a man ought to examine himself before he eats. You examine your own heart. Not my job to examine yours, not yours to examine mine. You examine your own heart before you eat and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Whoa. You realize that every time we take the Lord's Supper? If I don't get things straightened out between me and God and me and the other people, if I got something against somebody else, if I don't get that straightened out, listen, I'm, I'm calling on the judgment of God. And this is what he says. This is kind of judgment in heaven. That is why many among you are weak, sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep. He's not talking about, you know, oh, fell asleep in church because the preacher's dull. <laughs> <laughs> this is euphemism. This is speaking well of, 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 of a bad thing. Like when Lazarus had died, Jesus said, my friend Lazarus is asleep. And the man said, when he's asleep, he'll wake up. He said, very plainly, no, Lazarus is dead. When, when, when we come to the Lord's Supper table, this is a very solemn, important time of self-examination to see where do I stand in my heart, my soul, my spirit before God. And I examine that. I partake of those elements, confessing what might be there that should not be in my life, Fixing what should be fixed that is in my life, or maybe somebody else. Making, you know, reconciling and restitution. And then I take up those elements and I get brought into sweet communion with the Lord. Through all this, he says, but if we would judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. But when we are judged, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned. Listen, we're not going to be condemned. Jesus took all of the price for us. We're the, under a dispensation of grace. But we will be disciplined. Discipline. Here's my final thoughts. This was a powerful passage. 
you've got to admit, whoa, this is heavy stuff. I just want to say this. Being a Christian is serious stuff. I think sometimes we treat it too lightly. Too lightly. We need to take our Christian faith far more seriously than we do. We do. We do. One last thought. My one last thought. Last line of your fill in the blanks. The antidote for a setback is called a reset. Now you gotta come back next week for the reset, because <laughs> we've run out of time. But there is a reset. That's next week we're going to talk about. The nation of Israel just suffered a humiliating, terrible defeat. They're doom and gloom and you know and all of that. But we're going to see that there is an antidote. It's called a reset. And we too have an antidote. It's called, if we will confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a good question. We'll see you next time as we look at the antidote. Okay, let's, let's just close the prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. It's, Lord, it's challenged us to look and see is there anything in our own lives that we're hiding from you that makes us have setbacks? Are we unfaithful, Lord? Expose that to us. Bring it to our minds. And then, Lord, put us on a path to, to confess that, get rid of that, get that out of our lives. So, Lord, that we might, might go forward and not backwards. All for your glory. Speak to our hearts right now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.